Today we're going to look at a nice formula called the Legendre duplication formula for the gamma function. So in particular, we'll show that gamma of z times gamma of z plus half is equal to 2 to the power 1 minus 2z times the square root of pi times gamma of 2z. And one of the main tools here will be something called the beta function, which is defined as follows. So b of zw is the integral from 0 to 1 of t to the z minus 1 times 1 minus t to the w minus 1. Now, via a simple change of variables that exchanges t with 1 minus t, we'll see that the beta function is symmetric in the two variables. Furthermore, there's this nice relation of the beta function with the gamma function. So, b of zw is gamma z gamma w over gamma z plus w. And this is exactly what we'll start with by proving this statement here. Okay, so let's get started. So we'll have gamma of z, gamma of w, and we'll rewrite each of those using the integral definition of the gamma function. So we have the integral from 0 to infinity of, let's see, u to the z minus 1, e to the minus u du, and then the integral from 0 to infinity of v to the w minus 1, e to the minus v dv. Okay, great. And now we'll make a change of variables in each of these variables before we push them together. And that change of variables will be as follows. So let's take u and replace it with x squared. Notice that means that du will be replaced with 2x dx. And we'll take v and replace it with y squared. That means that dv will be replaced with, let's see, 2y dy. So notice we pick up a 2 for each of those integrals, which means we pick up an overall 4. So we'll have 4, and then, then the integral from 0 to infinity. The bounds of integration will not change here. Okay, so let's see, this will give us x to the 2z minus 2 e to the minus x squared, and then du is x dx. Well, really it's 2x dx, but we took care of the 2 by pulling both of the 2s out into a 4. Now, I'd like to make a really simple simplification here, and that is I'll take this x and multiply it into this x to the 2z minus 2 and make it x to the 2z minus 1. And then we'll do a similar thing when we rewrite the second integral without really saying anything here about it. So this will give us the integral from 0 to infinity. We'll have y to the 2 w minus 1 e to the minus y squared dy. And now let's push these together into a single double integral. So now we'll have 4 and then the integral over, well, I'm going to write this as follows. The double integral over the region from 0 to infinity squared. In other words, that's the first quadrant. And now we'll have x to the 2z minus 1, y to the 2, w minus 1, and then e to the minus x squared plus y squared dA. Okay, good. And now the appearance of that x squared plus y squared motivates us to make a polar change of variables. So that's what we'll do right here. So that means we'll set x equal to r cos theta, y is equal to r sine theta. That means that dA is r dr d theta. So that's the standard differential area component for polar coordinates. I think that's well known. And then let's notice that our region of integration, which is the first quadrant, can be written in polar coordinates as follows. So r is on the interval from 0 to infinity, and theta will be on the interval from 0 to pi halves. Because again, we want that first quadrant. So now let's rewrite this in polar coordinates. So we'll have 4 the integral from 0 to pi over 2, the integral from 0 to infinity. This will be r to the 2z minus 1 times cosine to the 2z minus 1 theta. And then we'll have r to the 2w minus 1 times sine to the 2w minus 1 theta. And then we'll have 
e to the minus r squared, and then we'll have r dr d theta. And now let's underline all of our r terms and see what we get in the end for our exponent on r. So there are two r terms, and then we've got one more right here. So let's see, that'll leave us with r to the two times z plus one, times z plus w minus one. So that's what we get from combining all of those maybe factors of r there. Okay, so let's see. Now we can rewrite this as a product of integrals. We have four, the integral from zero to pi over two of cosine, the exponent of that is two z minus one theta, and then sine two w minus one theta d theta, and then our integral from zero up to infinity of, let's see, r to the two times z plus w minus one e to the minus r squared dr. So now let's bring that up and we'll keep going. So this is where we left ourselves off and now we're ready to keep going. So for this first integral, we're gonna make a change of variables. And in this case, the change of variables will be to set x. I know we used x earlier, but this is a new x we'll set x equal to r squared. Notice that that means that dx is equal to 2r dr, which means it's gonna kinda be useful to include our r back in here. And then we can make that a minus two, or if we want to, we can put a minus one in those parentheses. So like I said, that'll be a little bit more useful of a way to do this. Okay, so let's see how that's gonna be rewritten. So this two will cancel this four out to give us a two. So we'll have two and then the integral from zero to infinity, the bounds of integration don't change. We'll have x to the z plus w minus one, again, because x is equal to r squared and then e to the minus x dx. Okay, great. And then we're gonna do something over here as well. I'm gonna take a single sine and a single cosine out and rewrite this as the sine squared theta raised to the w minus one and then cosine squared theta raised to the z minus one and then times sine theta, cosine theta, d theta. And then I'm actually gonna take a two and bring it in here as well because now we can see this two sine theta cosine theta is simply the derivative with respect to theta of sine squared theta. And that sets up a change of variables and the change of variables here will be t equals sine squared theta. Okay, so let's see what that's gonna look like now. So we'll have the integral from zero to one because that's how the bounds of integ integration will change. This two will be eaten up with this two right here, so I might as well erase this. And then we'll have t to the power w minus one. And then cosine squared is one minus sine squared, so that's one minus t to the power z minus one. And then finally dt. But now we can write this out. Notice this first integral is most definitely the gamma of z plus w and that second integral is the beta function evaluated at w and z, which is the same thing as the beta function evaluated at z and w. Okay, so now let's look at this extreme left and right hand side and notice by a simple division by gamma of z plus w, we get this second portion of our lemma. Okay, so now armed with this lemma, it's actually not too hard to get here and that's what we'll do now. So we just got done proving this interesting formula involving the beta function. And now we'll use this formula where w is equal to z. So that means our numerator will be gamma of z times gamma of z, and our denominator will be gamma of two z. The motivation for that is our final formula involves gamma of z and gamma of two z. So by our you know, lemma that we just proved, this is the beta function evaluated at z, z. Okay, cool. But now we can rewrite that using the definition of the beta function. So that's the integral from zero to one of, let's see, we have t to the z minus one times one minus t to the z minus one dt. But now we're gonna make a change of variables. 
and the change of variables here will be t equals one plus x over two. Notice that means that dt is equal to simply dx. Also, when t is equal to zero, that shows us that x is equal to negative one, whereas when t is equal to one, we get x is equal to positive one. So that's how the change of variables happens with that, you know, or that change of bounds of integration happens with that change of variables. Okay, so let's see what we have now. So our dt component, which I think I said was dx, but it's very clearly one half dx. So we'll get a half out front, and then we'll have the integral from minus one to one at this stage of, well now this will be one plus x over two raised to the z minus one, and then one minus x over two raised to the z minus one, and then dx. But now we're gonna put these two together, given that they have the same exponent, we'll have a half the integral from minus one to one of, let's see, one minus x squared dx. But then we'll have two to the z minus one, two to the z minus one, those are both in the denominator. So that'll give us a two to the z minus two in the denominator, but when, but that'll give us a two to the z minus two in the denominator, but combined with this, two in the denominator, that'll be two to the z minus one in the denominator, brought up to the numerator will be two to the one minus two times z. Okay, so just to reiterate, that's what we get from bringing this two and this two out of the exponents, raising them to the appropriate power, combining with the two that's already in the denominator, and then raising it up to the numerator. And then this is all raised to the power z minus one dx. So just to reiterate, I got this two to the one minus two z by taking the twos in the denominator here, raising them to the appropriate exponent, combining them with what was out front, and then bringing it up to the numerator. Okay, now I'll use the fact that this is an even function to rewrite this as two times two to the one minus two z times the integral from zero to one of one minus x squared to the power z minus one dx. And, and next up, we'll perform a change of variables on this integral. So I think you can probably see one of the themes here is that we're performing tons of changes of variables. So here we'll take x and replace it with the square root of u. Notice that means that dx is equal to 1 half times u to the minus half du. So plugging that into our integral over here, the half will cancel this two which is out front, and then let's see, we're left with two to the one minus two z. The bounds of integration don't change, so I have the integral from zero to one. And then we'll have u to the minus half, but I'm gonna write that as u to the power half minus one, and then we'll have one minus u to the power z minus one. And then this is du at the moment. Okay, great. But next up, let's notice that this is two to the one minus two z, and then this integral ex is exactly the beta function evaluated at half and z. Oh, so now that's good. Now we can apply our formula over here, and that'll allow us to write this as, well, let's see, we still have this constant out front, and then this beta function, well, that'll be the gamma function evaluated at a half, the gamma function evaluated at z over the gamma function evaluated at z plus one half. And now we're gonna use a little bit of a cheat, but I think this is a well-known fact that the gamma function evaluated at a half is simply the square root of pi. So now let's see, we've got this side is equal to this side. So let's maybe write that equation at the top and then we'll do the last couple of steps. So taking out all of the middle and then rewriting gamma of a half as root pi, this is what we're left with. But check it out, we can cancel a single gamma of z from both sides of the equation and then cross multiply. Cross multiplying will give us gamma of z times gamma of z plus half equals two to the one minus two z times the square root of pi times gamma of two z. 
Okay, great. But now let's look at an application of this. Let's set z equal to n, which is a positive integer, and see what we can get out of this. So if we plug z equal to n into this and maybe solve for this gamma of, now it's n plus a half, we get something nice. So we'll have gamma of n plus one half is now equal to two to the one minus two n times the square root of pi times gamma of two n over gamma of n. So something like that. But now let's recall that gamma of 2n is simply equal to 2n minus 1 factorial, whereas gamma of n is equal to n minus 1 factorial. Let's putting the gamma function in terms of the factorial. So altogether, we have this nice formula for the gamma function evaluated at positive half integers. So gamma of n plus half is 2 to the 1 minus 2n times the square root of pi times 2n minus 1 factorial over n minus 1 factorial. So we can actually simplify that to the descending product 2n minus 1 times 2n minus 2 times 2n minus 3. And where are we going to end? Well, we end at n plus 1 times n. Notice we don't have to go all the way to the ground because everything else is going to get canceled by this n minus 1 factorial. So there we have it. We have this nice formula for this gamma function at half positive integer values. And then furthermore, we can maybe even make this look a little bit nicer by combining that n plus 1 half to 2n plus 1 over 2. So now it looks real nice, and that allows us to make some calculations very easily. So let's, for instance, do gamma of 7 over 2 as an example. So if we have gamma equals 7 over 2, notice that's the same thing as having n equal to 3 here, because we've got 6 plus 1 in the numerator. So that'll give us 2 to the power, so it'll be 1 minus 6, so that's 2 to the minus 5, so that's going to be 1 over 32. So we've got the square root of pi over 32, and then 2n minus 1 here, so that'll be 5 times 4 times 3. We know we need to end at 3 because we end, end at n equals 3. So let's see, we can simplify that a little bit. We can take this 4 and cancel out, out with this to an 8, and then we have 3 times 5, which, 5, which is 15. So we have 15 times the square root of pi over 8. And then, of course, you could find out a lot of other values if you wanted to, but I'll leave that to your exploration. So I'd like to mention that there's something really special happening with these half integer values that doesn't really work with one third integer values. And it simply comes down to the fact that if a number is one half away from an integer and you add it to another number which is one half away from an integer, you get an integer. And that doesn't work with numbers that are an integer plus one third. Although there are similar, more complicated formulas for maybe more arbitrary denominators. Maybe post in the comments if you'd like to see a video about that. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpinmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.